Hey, welcome to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis, and today I'm going to do my top 20 of the past 20. That's my top 20 albums of the last 20 years. 20 for 20, 2000 to 2020, this year. You may ask yourself, hey Hollis, that sounds like an end of year thing. Why are you doing it now? Because we may not make it to the end of the year. 2020 will not stop. It is relentless, and it might not allow 2021 to happen. Bring it. So here's my recap of the top 20 albums of the last 20 years. And I limited myself to one album per year. That's it. These are all subjective. This is just my list. It may not be your list. Yada, yada, yada. Disclaimer. So without further ado, adieu. Let's kick this puppy off. Begin the countdown. Begin the countdown. 2000 brings us Idlewild. 100 Broken Windows. It had competition. This narrowly beat out the Toilet Boys. But I felt that's a little bit inside, even for me. Great as this is. This is the band you want to check out. Men and women of a certain age. Do you remember fondly the early R.E.M. albums? Did you wish that a band would come along and have that same sound and that same magic? Well, you might have slept on them. Idlewild 100 Broken Windows is that debut you were looking for. Just put it on, let the whole damn thing play. From opener, Little Discouraged, to Rose Ability, all the way to Closer, the Bronze Medal. There is no let up on this album. I remember buying this. I bought it in July of 2001 for five bucks, and it was one of the smartest purchases I ever made. Two other people in the record store passed by this album, and the one said to the other, oh my God, I lived on that album last year. The person seemed kind of cool, so I bought the album without hearing it. That's a good $5 album. Anyway, if you love early R.E.M., check out 100 Broken Windows by Idlewild. Their follow-up is good too, the remote part, but trust me, 2000, baby. 2001 brings us The Green Album by Weezer. Their third album and their comeback after the sophomore slump, some people said, that was Pinkerton, AKA my favorite Weezer album. This was their first album with Mikey Walsh. He's this little cutie pie right here replacing Matt Sharp on bass, and I thought he did a great job. This was kind of what I wanted to hear after Pinkerton. It's somewhat a return to form, aka the Blue Album, but it still has some rough edges and some off-kilter songwriting, vis-a-vis -vis Ergo, somewhat like Pinkerton. The music on here is great. Don't Let Go, Photograph, Hash Pipe, my favorite song on the album, Crab, and of course Island in the Sun, which took over the planet. Knockdown, Drag Out, Fight, the whole damn thing is good. My favorites on this album are Crab and Glorious Day. And Oh Girlfriend, The Closer, is a sweet change of pace and the perfect way to bed down this album. Big fan of this album. Although it pretty much set the boring standard that they were going to be standing in front of a color with an eponymous title. So that's a pretty boring decision. So for that, this album deserves a little shade. However, this album is a strong comeback for the boys and my pick for 2001. 2002 brought us White Blood Cells, The White Stripes. This came out on Sympathy for the Record Industry. It is a fantastic album. This beat out Interpol's debut, Turn on the Bright Lights. It also beat out Queens of the Stone Age. And at first I had Interpol over this because it was such a strong debut. But in retrospect, this is a far stronger album and The White Stripes would only get bigger and better. So I simply had to highlight this album. I bought it at Other Music in New York, which is sadly defunct. From the opening guitar of Dead Leaves in the Dirty Ground, you know that this album is a major step up for the band. I really love Dish Steel. That's still kind of my favorite album by White Stripes, but I don't believe that their songwriting was ever as clever or as arresting as it is on this album. I'm finding it harder to be a gentleman, uh, fell in love with a girl. It's got rockers, like I think I smell a rat. It's got sweet, innocent little songs, like We're Going to Be Friends. Oh, that's my favorite song on the album. But when I heard the song, The Union Forever, and I was listening to it, and I was like, whoa, this is about Citizen Kane. That's when this album could do no wrong by me. It's great music, but it comes in such a delicious package. Their aesthetic, the presentation. Look at these two beautiful people and their color schemes. Just the art direction alone. I just, I love this. Pretty good year, 2002. 2003 brought us, yeah, 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 it's fever to tell. Sorry, Switchfoot. This is a picture disc, which is very awkward to hold. <laughs> Beautiful though. 
both sides. And the sound on this is amazing, even given that it's a picture disc. So if you see this, don't be scared off by the garish design. Just jump on it. It sounds great. After their strong EP debut, which was amazing, and put out on Touch and Go Records, I was waiting for the next album by this band. It exceeded all my expectations. Day with the Night, Black Tongue, No, No, No. There's no let up on this. The song Maps, of course, was a big hit and everyone knows how great Maps is. But Why Control is the song I listen to all the time still. I love Why Control. Modern Romance is a great sleepy ender to the album. Tick, Pin, Cold Light. This is one you just put on and let it play. This beat out White Stripes Elephant, it beat out The Fiery Furnaces first album, and it beat out Brian Jonestown Massacre. I was a big fan of this album, but I got the fever to tell this is my pick for 2003. 2004, The Future Heads. I love this album. Every once in a while, I have the crave to hear this album, and when I put it on, it's better than I remembered. This time around, as I was listening to stuff for this list, I was like, oh yeah, The Future Heads, I remember liking Side 1 and I put it on, side one is great, and side two is great. They're both great. They don't sound like anyone else. That's how they beat out Franz Ferdinand to get on this list. That's how they beat out TV on the radio. That's how they beat out the Libertines. They didn't sound like anyone else that year, vocally. And I love when a band comes out and they have a new sound. They all harmonize with vocals that sound somewhat like heart palpitations set to music. Lay Garage, A to B, Alms, there are great songs on this. The big song on this to hear if you're gonna like them is Decent Days and Nights. Check that out. If you don't like that song, you will not like this album. But if you like that song, the album just gets better and better. It ends on Hounds of Love and Man Ray, two real heavy hitters on the album. After you listen to Max Ernst from Mission of Burma, why don't you throw on Man Ray by the Future Heads. There's my little mixtape building block for you. We're going all avant-garde artists. Gotta be people like me out there, somewhere. 2004 is the future heads for me. 2005 brings us Louis XIV, The Best Little Secrets Are Kept. I can't stress enough what a stellar album this is. This is their second full length. This beat out Block Party, Silent Alarm, which is an album that I really love from that year. But it just couldn't beat out this album, which I return to with regularity from year to year. And I'm trying real hard to think of a track that I don't like on here. If you want to know the recipe for Louis XIV, you take three parts T-Rex, one part Eddie Izzard, and four parts Corvassier, and that's how you get this. The main guys behind Louis XIV, Jason Hill and Brian Karsig, each share vocal duties. Finding Out True Love is Blind and God Killed the Queen. Those are the two tracks I send you to to find out if you like this album. And you will like this album. If you're a big T-Rex fan, go to Pledge of Allegiance. You will either love it or hate it based on how much T-Rex worship goes on in that song alone. But they also have their own thing going on here. There's a little bit of a gothic twist to their t rex -tacy. I saw them on this tour opening for Franz Ferdinand at Irving Plaza. They're so good. For better or worse, they sounded exactly like the album. With an album this good, you want them to sound like the album. A Letter to Dominique, Illegal Tender, this entire album is good. Run, Don't Walk. 2006 brings us The Sounds, Dying to Say This to You. I love this album. I also love their album before it, their debut album. This is fantastic as well. But for the year in question, it just doesn't get better than this. This is a rockin' album you can dance to. They're that perfect rock band you can dance to, which for many years rock bands forgot about. You know, the Ramones made people dance. Songs like Queen of Apology, Painted by Numbers, Ego. It is one great track after another. Songs like Much Too Long just make me so fucking happy, I can't believe it. There's softer stuff on it. Night After Night sounds like it would fit in perfectly with the stage show of Hedwig and the Angry Inch. It is a great album. I'm shocked at how many people don't know the sounds. Never underestimate the charm of vocals by someone who does not speak English as their first language. The inflections are adorable. This is a great album. It's one of my favorite covers with these two beautiful women on it from the Miss Shapes parties back in NYC that is now giving me flashbacks. Anyway, incidentally, this is from Music on Vinyl. It is a numbered pressing. It's on white vinyl. The pressing sounds fantastic. I can't recommend this highly enough. 2007 brings us 
Modest Mouse, we were dead before the ship even sank. I'm laughing because at first I said we were drunk before the ship even sank. That might be a better title, it's funnier, and we know why the ship sank. This was their first album with Johnny Marr, and I feel he was the songwriting shot in the arm that the band needed at that point. Because I loved their earlier albums, but I felt they were kind of casting about for some new inspiration at the time. And Johnny is what the doctor ordered. He sat down with leader Isaac Brock, and the two instantly started writing songs, just like Johnny used to do with Morrissey. And the songs poured out. Dashboard, Fire It Up. This whole damn album is packed with great music. If you're at all on the fence about this album, let me push you onto the good side of the yard. Get it. Just get it. I hear it. No, I hear your excuses. Just get it. 2008 belonged to Tiger's Jaw. This album is one of my favorite albums. I listen to it more now than I did at the time. I have a confession to make. I am full-blown addicted in my adult life to emo. Tiger's Jaw is one of those albums I just put it on and it instantly makes me feel better. This is a second pressing put out on Run For Cover Records and every song on it is great. The Sun, Plane vs. Tank vs. Submarine, I Saw Water, Chemicals. If all four of those beautiful songs in a row don't grab you, first of all, you have no heart. Second of all, this band isn't for you. But I just love their earnest, heartfelt, innocent music. Take, for example, the lyrics of Chemicals. We are made from chemicals, but what holds us together is much more than that. You are strong, so much stronger than me, all along. Because you are everything, and I am nothing. <clears throat> what? If one of you gets this album after watching this, this entire video was not in vain. 2009 brings us Florence and the Machine, Lungs. This is an overwhelming album. It's beautiful, it's gothic, it's harsh, it's soft, it checks all the boxes. My wife got me into this band. She used to come to my DJ nights and she would request Florence and the Machine, and I didn't have any, so I had to get some. And I would play the song that spoke to me, which is My Boy Builds Coffins, which is on this. It's my favorite song on the album still. Part of that nostalgic? Maybe, but it's a great song. As with most bands that broke big in recent memory, the big hit off here is the one I can't stand, Dog Days Are Over. And it is not even indicative of the rest of the songs on this album. Kiss With A Fist is a great song. It's almost like they took We're Going To Be Friends by The White Stripes and they said, we can make this louder and more aggressive, but we don't want to lose the charm. The word that comes to mind is lush. Really, really lush production on this. Howl, drumming song, Between Two Lungs, there's no let up on this album. And it's a beautiful album to have. And it even comes in rose-colored vinyl. This album's appeal will not be lost on most of us. And these guys blew up so big, it's hard to say that 2009 belonged to any other band. Sorry, Chicken Foot. Up next for 2010, Merchant Ships, represented here. I came late to the party on Merchant Ships. I don't have any physical media for Merchant Ships. They're a download on my phone. If you can find one of their cassettes or one of their CDRs, more power to you, but they're a band that really grew in acclaim over YouTube. Anyway, I was overjoyed to discover For Cameron, the EP by Merchant Ships. Let me very quickly give you the lyrics for Things Left In Last Year, the opening track off the EP. Let go of your bitterness and realize you are not alone. We all stare at vacant ceilings, wishing we could just let go. We're all captains of a sinking ship. The setting sun helps pass the time as we sing along to our demise. And then they just scream it, repeating, as we sing along to our demise. When I hear that, I just want to tear down a building. Those are outrageously good lyrics. Outrageous! My second favorite song on it is Something That Matters. Something That Matters is so charming and sweet and innocent, along with the little darkness that's underneath all of that, that gives it its real power. If you want their most emo moment, Check out sleep patterns. Most of it is spoken, and the lyrics will kind of mess up your brain for a while. Incidentally, they broke up just after that. That was their last EP, so it catches them just as the seams were coming apart on the band, and it comes through in the music. So 2010 was my Merchant Ships year. Joyce Manor. Full disclosure, I could have picked any Joyce Manor album, but if I could pick only one year on which to focus a Joyce Manor album, it would be 2011. Their debut is stunning. I love this album. This is a band for people who feel the Ramones are a bit too prosaic. Their songs are routinely a minute long. This was put out on 6131 Records. It is a very nice pressing. 
Side one is a perfect side. Side one is one of my all-time favorite side ones ever. This band walks that fine line between dissonance and ear candy. I don't know how they do it. They're jangly, they're ragged, but there's also beautiful melody within each of these tracks. Orange Julius, Call Out, Beach Community, Derailed, and Famous Friend. As with most bands, it's the lyrics that hook me. Here are the lyrics to Derailed. When you make it to your driveway, will you call to let me know that you're okay? And when you make it to your bedroom, do you collapse on your bed right away? Or do you lay and think about how fucking lonely you've become? You're obsessed with revenge and it's starting again. Bad tattoos, oh, and losing the saddest of friends. So you ache through the day, cause you'll never mend your ways. How are these guys so young? With lyrics like that, how are they so young? If you didn't get in on the ground floor of Joyce Manor, grab any of their albums. You will not be disappointed. But this was a high water mark for me. This was a stunning debut. This album kicked my ass. 2012 belonged to Title Fight, Floral Green. I was a big fan of hardcore punk. I am a big fan of emo. I also like something in between, like Overwhelming Color Fast or Toadies. This is a combination of all of that. Incidentally, I kept it in a shrink. No sleeve could tame it, horribly oversized. So I used the shrink wrap as a sleeve protector. If you're Title Fight curious, Side One is a stunner. Numb But I Still Feel It, Leaf, Like a Ritual, Secret Society, and Head in the Ceiling Fan. If there's one thing that all these albums I'm showing you have in common, it's Side One just hooks you, and it tells you everything about the band musically in one big blast. I really think Title Fight should have been even bigger than they were. This catches them even in a transitional phase. They started out a lot harder, and they keep moving more and more melodic. I think they got the magic formula on this album. And I'm still curious to see where they go from here, but I really, really love this album. Up next, My Bloody Valentine, MBV. MBV is also the name of their self-owned label. This was a strong comeback from My Bloody Valentine. In the first few seconds of putting this album on, from the initial feedback twang that you hear, you know it's gonna be exactly what you want. Band leader Kevin Shields understands what makes his band great and he continues to carve out rhythms and melodies in deep sound textures that more pretentious shoegaze bands would be happy to simply get lost in. Only Tomorrow is my jam on this, but for the shoegaze uninitiated, I'd advise you to check out the track New You. It's a great toe in the water track to see if you want to follow the band further into their murky center. It's another album that I have on download only, so I'm gonna stop telling you that. And you'll just know that when it's this disembodied picture, it's a download for me. 2014 brings us The Both. This is the debut and to date only LP by The Both, which is Amy Mann and Ted Leo. I love this album. It combines the best elements of both. Ah, I just got that. Ted Leo and Amy Mann. Everything they do separately melds perfectly. She brings the sweetness, he brings the raggedness, and on tracks like Milwaukee, No Sir, and Volunteers of America, it clicks perfectly. My favorite jam on this is You Can't Help Me Now. It is a beautiful song. It's got a little bit of Amy Mann Save Me appeal, and the two of them trade it off so beautifully. I'm a big fan of this album. You like hooks? It's got hooks. You like great lyrics? It's got great lyrics. You're tired of overproduction? You want things stripped down? It's stripped down. So if you're curious, Listen to You Can't Help Me Now. This is smart music. This is music for grown-ups. It's grown folks talking. This is a beautiful album by the most perfect of bedfellows. This whole album just spins like a top. 2015 brought us The Libertines, Anthems for Doomed Youth. This was a big comeback for The Libertines. I love The Libertines. I have everything by them. And this was a strong comeback. My runner-up album was the comeback from Veruca Salt. I love seeing them come back because I'm a big fan of American Thighs, their first album. But I had to give it to the Libertines. This was such a major reformation, musically. And it's almost like no time has passed when you hear this album. Gunga Din was the lead-off single from the album, and it's the perfect comeback track. They're so damned good together. Of course, I'm speaking of Carl Barrett and Pete Doherty. The songwriting team, the nucleus of the band, two brothers who are like oil and water, but who love each other. It's a poetic band. It's a smart band. There's a lot for you here. The track Belly of the Beast sounds like Vintage Libertines, a feat they pull off several times on this album. One of the best songs on the album is You're My Waterloo. It was, of course, one of the Libertines' best unreleased tracks from as far back as like 2010. Here it's been re-recorded 
This new version is far better musically, far more melancholy, very well done, but it lost a little bit of the original's ragged charm, but I'm being very nitpicky. Anthems for the Doomed is the best kind of comeback album. It's one that trods new ground for the band, yet still has that familiar ring of all the things you loved about them. So that's why they're my pick for 2015 album. 2016 brought us Car Seat Headrest, Teens of Denial. Quick shout out to my man Lyndon, who turned me on to this band. Lyndon is younger than me. I slept on them and I quickly made up for it. This was the album he recommended to me. It quickly became one of my favorites. This album answers the question, what if Beck had fronted pavement, drawled vocals, angular guitars, and nostalgic production that even upon first listen make these songs seem somewhat familiar. Fill in the blank, Vincent, Joe gets kicked out of school for using drugs with friends but says this isn't a problem. There are so many refreshing songs on this. Not just refreshing in the song craft, but refreshing in the execution. My favorite songs on this are Destroyed by Hippie Powers, Drunk Drivers slash Killer Whales, Connect the Dots, and Joe Goes to School but the entire album is good and you can't go wrong with it. So I highly recommend this. This is one of the high recommends from the recent past. 2017 brought us Wire, Silver slash Lead. It's yet another comeback on this list, but it is a strong return to form for Wire. The song Diamonds in Cups sounds like classic era Brian Eno, and that ain't a bad thing. The song This Time is very close to an updated version of classic wire, which is what we all signed up for. The album may be a tad uneven, but they're on far more than they're off, and it is a strong return to form for wire. They've updated their sound significantly, and they've fallen in love with melody. If you did not know this was wire, you would think this was a younger band, and that's the highest praise I can heap on wire at this point. So welcome back, wire. We missed you. 2018 belonged to Snail Mail, Lush. I love this album. This is the perfect album, whether you want to sit down and read a book, or you're cooking dinner, or you want to sit down and read the lyrics and listen intently to the album. It's every mood music. Snail Mail is basically one person, Lindsay Jordan, but she put a great band together and put out this album, Lush. Lindsay Jordan's voice is beautiful. It's got this sleepy kind of tone to it, and at times it cracks like a 14-year-old boy's voice, and it's just adorable. If you're curious about this album, check out the track Pristine. It is the perfect distillation of everything that Stale Mail does well. It's very hooky. It's got beautiful vocals. It's music from another time. It harkens back to indie music you loved in the early 90s. It's very much got that feel. And of course it's on Matador, who've been doing it and doing it and doing it well for so many years, finding these great young bands with something to say. I highly recommend Snail Mail Lush. And this is my 2018. All right, I'm ending up with two more downloads for you. We're at 2019, which brings us Slater Kinney, The Center Won't Hold. Aside from butchering the Yates quote, this is a great album. Slater Kinney were always such a ragged, jangly little band, and that was part of the fun. So I'm not a big fan of the production job that St. Vincent did here, with the exception of Can I Go On, which is my jam off this album. There the production works perfectly, but I feel the production's a little too heavy-handed for this combo. If you see footage of Slater Kinney touring this album live, you see how good these songs truly are. There's a fifth gear they kick into. They come alive. But even millennial catering production can't hide how great Slater Kinney truly are. And a track like Love is irresistible. Check out Love and Can I Go On, my two favorites from this album. Slater Kinney won 2019. Here we go, you ready? Where's my drum roll? Note to self, look into drum roll. 2020 brings us Morrissey. Because that's how crazy this year is. I am not a dog on a chain. Talk about flipping. I want to be your dog on its head. Fucking A, Mazer. This whole album is surprisingly good. If not a full return to form by Morrissey, there are far more flashes of his usual brilliance than there have been in recent memory. It's his strongest album in years. I have a few favorite tracks on it that I want you to check out. My Hurling Days Are Over is a sweet, sentimental song that I think you're gonna be left with after you finish hearing the album for the first time and you might wanna go drop the needle back on that bad boy. I also want you to check out Bobby Don't You Think They Know, which is a duet featuring Thelma, Don't Leave Me This Way, Houston, who kills it. 
she kills it. And the two of them, oddly, work well together. It's a beautiful mixture, so I highly recommend that. That is it. I'm spent. I'll see you in another 20 years. That's it for this week on Pop Culture Graveyard. I hope you enjoyed this 20 for 20 and you got some value out of it. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and I will see you next week with a lot more cool stuff.